Lisa Brager is a poet, writer, and educator. She is an assistant professor of English at Pine Manor College and the director of the undergraduate English and Creative Writing program. Lisa is also a certified dog massage therapist and owner of Canine Massage Works. Her poems appear in numerous journals, including the Sand Hills Review, Hunger Mountain, and the Grolier Annual, uh, for a few, to name a few. And in 2015, she was a finalist for the Barbara Deming Memorial Grant and the runner-up for the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, and here to share some of her essence and some of her poetry with us this morning. We have Lisa Brager. Please give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to read some old and new poems. Um, and if, if some of you have seen our flyer for our upcoming uh, spiritual retreat that I'm doing with Cheryl and Mary, uh, you'll notice I'm pictured with my dog, Macy May. So um, that has nothing to do with anything, uh, except <laughs> my first poem today is called, is my dog's favorite, of course, because the title is For the Love of Dog. For the Love of Dog. Brambles at the field edge glow crimson and the old oaks by the river soak in winter's late afternoon light. While seasons have their purpose, mine is anyone's guess. A woman walking a dog in nature, an elongated shadow before me, the sun about to call it a day. <clears throat> when I was young, there was a window looking onto the street where kids played stickball and jeered at passing traffic. Soon as someone ran off, I grabbed my glove to get in the game, but the boys taunted, no girls, get lost, and shoved me away. So often I sat on the curbstone running road grit through my fists. How the picture changes. Sparrows build a new nest in the eaves by the feeder that sways in the wind cloudless sky. Some days begin with clarity before trouble gets her paint brushes. Mice in the grain bin, hawk above the roof ridge, weather about to change, old New England. Other days need a jump start. This 2015 winter, the worst in recorded history. Yet, when Forsythia bursts on the scene, what more do we need to know? The dog drops a ball by my chair and looks into my eyes. We both cherish the game, <clears throat> the twist and release, something so far flung all four paws leave the ground. Thank you. That's amazing. Nice <laughs> Little closer to the mic, that better. Hello, Mike. <laughs> Mike and I go back a long way. Uh, this next poem is a poem that was selected for the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, which was an honor for me being an avid fan of the late, great Ruth Stone. And it's called Time Under a Bridge. I don't want to leave this world. My friends are in it, and there's so much beauty. Even beneath the pigeon-pocked bridge, the simple steel and concrete off-ramp seeped with runoff, tubercular, that runs over roadways and part of the river that leads nowhere. There's a park bench, 
a gathering of squirrels around a stale loaf of bread. Who wouldn't want to spend time here? Yesterday, along the greenway under cloudless late January sky, a flurry of bluebirds sang in the branches. Today, I follow blue hospital signs near Boylston, neighborhood of pressure cooker bombs, and recall survivor Heather Abbott as I take the elevator to the malignancy floor. Painted toenails on a prosthetic leg, <clears throat> my deviant cells abnormally split, high-dose chemotherapies target and destroy. She decided they take the leg to heal the body. I shut my eyes and see the harbor, gulls squawk over fishing boats along the docks, dive for entrails, fish heads, and carry them satisfied through salt air. Thank you. <laughs> I believe my dog is in this poem also. Um, drought. There's a commotion of howling dogs. One has a sharp tone woof, another a yowl as I sit for meditation. Um tara tu tara as traffic noise carries water <coughs> at carries over water at the commuter hour, the raucous birds at the feeders, and my own dog has something to say. The darkness, the sky darkens and clouds move in. It's not easy this life low lake of ambition, ho-hum day, pile of bills on the table. Someone scrapes a knee and soon the faucet gives out, coils I carry for what Herrera calls planet on a skateboard of dynamite, how none of us gets out of this alive. Still, I remember beneath the lantern of moonlight, we walked the ocean's edge, listened to waves silver the darkness as if infinity could be counted on one hand. Now, the boats come to their moorings. On the dock, the great blue heron caws at my dog as she swims too close untroubled by the feathers she ruffles, each with an eye to what flashes beneath the surface. It's June. Already there are signs for the water ban, odd and even days. But wild white rose still grows along the back fence. Sweet breath speaks volumes. There are many shades of green after rainfall, ants at work on the peony buds. Even so, it has taken all day to soak in a single moment. Macy's not in this poem. Distances. I don't want you to think I'm obsessed with my dog, so <laughs> I'm just pointing out she's not in this one. <laughs> Distances. Sometime time halts in the trance light, glazed between this side of the granite structured street, and over there, the icy glow from the steel mouth of the subway. Some days I enter the turnstile with a token and wait on the wooden bench for childhood, like a trolley to reappear. 
How I held to the mother who wouldn't leave the pill bottle closed and sank like a small boat, crack in the bow, useless oars. How each washed up day the stink of fish rot along the curve of the bay's belly where black flies swarmed in hungry heat. We trekked out to the water's lip, my friends and I, to lug in what the ocean left. A plank for stickball in the schoolyard or anchor line to rope over oak limbs and climb to the tree's peak. Some part of the past keeps like rare coins in an old pocket or awakens on the other side of sleep as sun slants through the crooked shade of my window and chimes when Canada wind burns late November. This is the month I was born. In the weak light of early morning, a city so long ago, I sit with songs of so many selves. Uh, so many selves. Notes scatter like milkweed across the sun-bleached lawn. Anonymous names embroidered into the torn sleeves of telephone poles. Today, I walk unbidden with the moon, with the wind's teeth grinding as I go. Trees in tethered sway under the moon's vagueness and look back into the blur of where I've been, remembering a faint thought once held in a doorway. The past. I'm driving to work, radio playing supremes, and suddenly it's our old den set off from the rest of the frenzied house where I danced myself an escape route of 45s on the old Victrola. I drive a little faster to the Motown sound and almost miss my turn, the way the past clouds my sense of direction, yanks at my coat like a kid insistent with the same bad riddle, some knock-knock joke we've been over a million times. Or I'm driving her to school and she doesn't want to go, keeps pulling at the wheel, her mother threatening with a fist or the back seat if she doesn't start acting normal or her age. She climbs into the back seat anyway, a little sullen, a little sorry, climbs back into a time she can't even speak of, taps at the headrest some secret code sent out while I spend a day at work concentrating on anything but the back seat beat. My parents trusted that man until he took me once when I was seven and knock knock, haven't we all heard this one before? The teacher at the blackboard wondering Who's there in the third row, lost in some dream outside the classroom window with no way back? The liquor cabinet I hid inside and returned like a bee to the hive, the past buzzing like the chainsaw used to cut down the sick maple on the front lawn. Our suburban grass almost as green as everyone else's, except the police knew us. The way my mother tossed my father's clothes out the window as if he were in them, screaming, never come back, while my brother chased me down the street, knocked me to the ground with moves stolen from wrestling shows he thought wicked funny, and sometimes as if trapped in a steel cage death match, 
The neighbors couldn't get him off me. My heart starts racing faster for no apparent reason till I'm spinning blue moon music. I learned all the words to, to have something I could sing with my dad when he'd visit. Something more than guess who knocks at the door. Now, I sit in an old oak desk and try to write a different story, but the past keeps tugging at my wrist as if there's one I haven't heard yet. One I couldn't possibly get. Thank you. And this, this last uh, poem is a new poem. i very proud to say, Cheryl, I finally finished my father poem. <laughs> uh, my father died a couple of years ago, and I've been struggling with this poem for a while. Elegy in Snow, it's written in three parts. One, hungry geese flock to feed on snow-covered fields, empty again, and ice along the river makes its mournful sound as it breaks below the surface. How many winters, how many walks have I walked this snow-hardened path where sometimes I sink in, fall hard and have to pull myself up the way you showed me through bankruptcy or boxing, showed me to keep punching through chemo, contusion on your forehead from your last fall, skin bruised beneath my bandage. How many days as shockingly clear as the day snowmelt made its way across the bend in the trail and I trudged under the sun's glare to cross precisely here, precisely where I took the call that you were gone. Not anywhere in particular that I could imagine, weightless blue winter air. Two, could you know the trees, how startled they stood, <clears throat> how frozen the icy ground, how far afield I found myself, my first fatherless steps as uncertain as toddling toward you in an old home movie, a grainy black and white, Figures in snowsuits wave to the camera, their mouths mouthing inaudible words. Three. Deeper in December, outside the picture window, sheets of snow drift as they did during the blizzard of 78 and obscure my view with white shrouds of frozen mist, the way death distances how I know you. No call of road conditions or talk of the great storms we shoveled through my sullen teenage years. No talk of sports or games we watched, our religion, the plays you taught me to believe in to approach the final set the game ender, the buzzer beater, how to get open downfield for the Hail Mary. No guts, no glory, you'd say. The bones of the house shiver. You are far away and closer than ever. A blank page, an absence of words. Thank you. I am writing a childhood memoir about my years living in an orphanage, which by definition means my mother was absent. It aggravates me that her absence is so present in my story. I wanted to write about a child, me, 
It aggravates me that consultants and writing groups always want to hear more about the fascinating mother character, her. In essays, too, as I'm trying to corral the wisdom I've accumulated by this august age, I find that I'm often circling the same subject matter, repairing, trying again, healing from damage. Once again, it aggravates me that I suspect all this is about what I wasn't able to do with her. What, you might ask, would be so bad about writing about my mom? Here's a list. Number one, <laughs> I didn't like her. She was not a kind or good or contributing person. Number two, more crucially, she didn't like me. She thought very bad things about me, most of which I have finally learned are not true. Number three, I didn't like myself in relation to her. I'm critical and ungenerous in a way I hardly ever am regarding anyone else. Number four, she was the most important person in my life for more than enough of it already. But even if I wanted to write about her, here's another list of reasons why she's nearly impossible to write about. She was missing from long stretches of my childhood, so I basically have to make up stuff about her. She misrepresented herself and our circumstances so much that I don't know what was true about her or our family life. She <coughs> maintained that she never lied, but that was definitely a lie. Moreover, she was subject to a magnificent degree of distortion. Number four, I can't find a balanced way to capture her mean treatment of me. It's too evil sounding, even though it's true. It makes me seem like a poor, unreliable narrator, which, can you guess, aggravates me. Nonetheless, here's a list of reasons why I actually seem to be writing about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> because of the many difficult aspects of her, she actually is an interesting character. She is the subject with which I have the most discomfort. Number three, I already finished my psychoanalysis, so shouldn't I be well equipped to deal with this stuff? <laughs> For the more I write about her, the easier it gets. I have less to lose. I keep exposing the least desirable aspects of myself. Finally, I want to put some of this tension and resistance to rest. I believe the best way to do that may be this narrative quest to the underworld to discover what I hate and fear most about her. Maybe I'll emerge the changed heroine, free of heartbreaking echoes and after images, fully my own person. But short of that, <laughs> what I really hope is that I can do this excavation work thoroughly enough that my kids don't feel compelled to write about me. Who, being loved, is poor? A question asked to illustrate how love can triumph for struggles of a meager life how less is sometimes more who being loved is poor Good. who being loved has despair Love's the source of hope when life asks more than we can bear. Strength to carry on from such a simple thing to share. Who, being loved, has despair? Who, being loved, has hate? Can one displace the other? Can love eradicate the hatred of a person, of a people, of a state? Who being loved?
loved as hate. Giving love is poor If we measure what we give We get back so much more Could this hold the answer to what we are searching for? Who giving love is poor Giving love is poor Good singing. The memories that threaten your history harbor the possibility of that seed, the truth. Call me fool if you like but your doubts play in light. There they wander lost, though strung together, on a mountain where there are no roads or people. Thank you. from Hopkinton. We would like to thank Mr. Trojan for the awesome tour of the H Camp Studio. If you are interested in fun and adventurous field trips, we recommend one, to learn a Girl Scout troop. And two, visiting H Camp to see how local television is created and produced. We also want to give a shout out to Kalala Supermarket to thank Dale for our Girl Scout troop tour. And for always giving us a space to set up our cookie booth.